Hey everyone, this is video three for chapter 10. So we spent the last two videos primarily building the aggregate supply, aggregate demand model, showing why aggregate demand looks the way it does, why we have two different aggregate supply curves. But now we're gonna to try to explain the shifts in aggregate supply and aggregate demand. So a lot of times these curves are gonna move and we're not really gonna have a great explanation for why the curves move within the model. We're gonna call those exogenous movements in aggregate supply and aggregate demand shocks. And a shock is just going to temporarily move us away from that full employment equilibrium. It's going to temporarily move us away from our long run aggregate supply. And so a primary example of a demand shock would be something like a decrease in velocity. If one day everybody decides to kind of hold on to cash and not spend as frequently, that's going to decrease the total velocity in the economy. And it's going to decrease the number of transactions people make. And because it decreases the number of transactions people make, everything else equal, this is gonna cause a decrease for the demand of goods, right? And so if we wanted to do this in the ASAD model, it's gonna look fairly similar to what we had last time. So if we're initially at our long run aggregate supply Y bar, we have our short run aggregate supply curve here at P bar. We're gonna say we're initially at this long run equilibrium, point A. But when we have this sudden decrease in velocity, the sudden shock to velocity, that's gonna decrease our total demand. It's gonna shift aggregate demand to the left from AD1 to AD2. But because prices are stuck in the short run, that means we're gonna to have to shift along the aggregate supply curve from point A to point B. And when we do that, because prices are stuck, that means output is gonna to have to fall. So we're initially gonna go from Y bar to Y2. But over time, firms are gonna be able to change prices in response to this new aggregate demand curve. And so over time, as firms can lower prices, they're gonna do that to bring us back to our long run aggregate supply curve. So firms are gonna slowly lower prices and it's gonna bring us back to our long run aggregate supply here at point C. So we'll have this lower total price level, but we'll still be in the long run at Y bar. So this is pretty much the same thing as we saw in the last video. But we can also have changes in aggregate supply. We can have supply shocks. And realistically, all a supply shock is, is something that changes production costs, something that changes the way a firm produces in the short run. Really good examples of adverse supply shock could be something like bad weather, a hurricane rolling through, something like that that reduces crop yields and it pushes up food prices. Something like workers unionizing, increasing the cost of inputs, increasing how much firms had to pay for labor, or potentially environmental regulations where it's costlier for a firm to produce. Similarly, we can have favorable supply shocks where it's suddenly we have really, really great weather for a period of time and crop yields are really good and that pushes down food prices. But a lot of times when economists talk about supply shocks, they usually talk about one very specific thing, and that is oil prices. And so it traditionally comes back to this episode in the 1970s when OPEC coordinated to reduce the supply of oil. So OPEC tried to reduce the supply of oil to increase global oil prices, and they were pretty successful. So in 1973, oil rose by over 10%, and then started to skyrocket in 1974, rose by 68% in 1974, and then another 16% in 1975. So realistically, the price of oil just about doubled in two years, three years. And because oil and gas are so intertwined with the supply chain in most countries, this higher, higher oil price and higher gas price meant that it was costlier to produce everything in the economy cost there to deliver goods to Walmart to wherever and so this higher oil price 
was a classic supply shock. And so it'll show up in our aggregate supply and aggregate demand model, but the process for it to change is going to be just a little bit different. So if we now have negative aggregate supply shock, we're going to start with the same basic curve. I'm going to start here at Y bar. And we're going to have an initial short run aggregate supply curve, SRAS1. And that's going to happen at P bar 1. So we're going to say that we're at our long run equilibrium with our aggregate demand curve. So we're going to say we start here at point A. Okay. But if suddenly the price of oil increases and it's costlier to produce everything, that's going to shift the short run aggregate supply curve up. So we're now going to have a new short run aggregate supply curve, SRAS2. Basically, when it's costlier for firms to produce, they're going to try to pass that on as best they can. And that's going to be through a higher short run price. Even with prices sticky in the short run, firms when the price of their inputs go up, are gonna have to change prices at least a little bit. And so we're gonna converge from point A up the aggregate demand curve to this new aggregate supply curve. We're gonna converge to point B. Basically, as it was costlier for a firm to produce, they had to produce less. And so that decreased total output at point B and that brought us to a lower level of output, Y2. But over time, this supply shock is going to play itself out in the economy. We're going to have to return to the long run aggregate supply curve in some way. And basically, that's going to be by firms slowly gaining, regaining control of their prices, firms slowly being able to decrease their prices so that we can converge back to our aggregate demand curve. So over time, we're going to converge back down the aggregate demand curve. Let me erase those. Over time, we're going to converge back down from point B to point A. And that's going to bring us back to our long run aggregate supply at Y bar in price level one. And so a supply shock in the short run is going to increase prices, but it won't have a long run effect on prices. Eventually, firms are going to change the way they produce things. They're going to try to get around these costlier production, production costs and get back to long run aggregate supply by reducing their, their total costs. Okay. And so the predictions of this model are that we should have inflation in the short run, but over the long run, it shouldn't have very significant effects. So we can take this and we can look at the US data from the 1970s and see if these predictions held. So it caused, again, it caused the shift upward in the short run aggregate supply curve. But without future supply shocks, prices were going to have to fall over time, according to these predictions. Prices were going to have to fall to bring us back to our full employment, to bring us back to Y bar. So if we look at US data, we can see that in the 1970s, oil prices skyrocketed, just like we said earlier. Oil prices almost doubled in this three year span and inflation went up at the same time. So inflation before, it's this right hand axis. Inflation before was about 6% and after the spike in oil prices went up to 10 or 11%. Inflation went up really, really significantly. At the same time, unemployment started to increase. And we know because of Oaken's law that when unemployment starts to increase, growth falls. So when unemployment started to increase, that meant that growth was falling. It meant that we had converged away from Y bar into that Y2, just like the model said that we had. But over time, we actually saw a second change in oil prices. We saw oil prices suddenly increase again. And we actually saw pretty much the same effects. We saw that as oil prices started to spike, they increased 50%, inflation went up again. 
Inflation went up to almost 13 or 14 percent this time, and unemployment slowly rose. Growth slowly followed. But over time, we actually decreased back to our traditional level of inflation that we know from previous graphs. And we, the unemployment rate started to decrease and it converged back to the natural rate. Just like we saw right here after that first oil shock, we saw that inflation in, started to decrease before that second oil shock. And we see that unemployment initially came down until we had that second oil shock. And so all of this leads to this kind of catch-22 for policymakers and supply shocks. Basically, a policymaker, because they can have influences in the short run, can engage in this thing called stabilization policy. They can try to have, they can try to engage in policy actions that are going to reduce these short run fluctuations. Basically, the Fed can try to do something to combat an adverse supply shock. And so we can use the aggregate supply and aggregate demand model to see what that would look like. Clear that. So let's say we have that same aggregate demand shock, I mean aggregate supply shock. Let's say that the price of oil increases. So if the price of oil increases, that's going to bring us here to our new short run aggregate supply curve, SRAS2. It's going to increase prices from P bar 1 to P bar 2. And so the Fed in the 1970s, again, was presented with this really difficult problem. They could increase aggregate demand and to try to combat this supply shock, but if they did that, Inflation was probably going to be higher forever. Basically, they could increase aggregate demand. They could shift the aggregate demand curve to the right and bring us back to long run equilibrium faster. So, in this case, we would go from point A up the aggregate demand curve here to point B but then quickly over here to point C, back to long run aggregate supply. But when the Fed would do that in the 1970s, it meant that we would have permanently higher prices. So we know that from that previous example, prices slowly converged back down the aggregate demand curve. That wouldn't happen in this scenario because the Fed combats this aggregate supply shock with greater aggregate demand, we're stuck at P2 now forever because that's where we've converged back to the long run aggregate supply. And so the Fed can engage in the stabilization policy. They can try to decrease the variability in Y, but to do that, you're gonna sacrifice a little bit in the price level. So in this case, the Fed When they did that, they brought us back to long run aggregate supply faster. We came back to our long run aggregate supply curve quicker than we would have otherwise. But they do so at the cost of higher prices. Our price level is now permanently higher. And so that's the difficult part of stabilization policy with traditional uh, with traditional supply shocks. If you can try to combat a supply shock and bring everything back to Y bar, but to do so, prices are going to have to stay permanently higher. You're going to have to converge back to your Y bar at this new price level, P bar 2. 
And that was the primary conundrum that faced the Fed in the 1970s. And that's a big part of the reason that we saw inflation as high as we did in the 1970s, because the Fed tried to combat supply shocks by raising aggregate demand. And when we had these continuous supply shocks, when the price of oil kept going up and up and up, it meant they kept having to raise aggregate demand and we kept converging to long run output at a higher price. And therefore we had higher inflation for a really long time. 